I'm a I'm an aspiring storyteller. Right? I want to I think that I think that storytelling is incredibly powerful. I think it you know it resonates so much with an audience. I I, I think that if I am successful in my life, if I do the things that I want to do and accomplish them, that um, what comes out of that is a great story and hopefully a story that can be an example to other people, right? And I think, I think that's a big goal that a lot of us have. Um, you know, you build a company for a few reasons, but I think one of the biggest ones is because the story you want to tell about your professional life is something different from you went to work at an office 40 hours a week. From cave drawings to family histories to stories around the fire, humans crave order among chaos, connection amid isolation. So we tell stories. Our mission at the Storytellers Network is to bring the art of story to the masses. Whether you are in marketing, you are an entrepreneur, or you're developing your own personal brand, telling your story effectively can make the difference between celebrating milestones and collecting unemployment. The Storytellers Network strives to help storytellers tell their stories so you can learn from the best. Now, your host, the inbound evangelist himself, Dan Moyle. So welcome to the Storytellers Network podcast. I'm so glad you're joining me today to listen in on this great conversation today. Uh, this episode, I talk with Rand Fishkin. Uh, now in season three, of course, we are hearing from video storytellers, which is awesome. And while Rand is a startup founder, uh, an SEO whiz, a tech guy, an author, and more, He's also someone who has used video for a long time and very successfully too. We can learn a lot from him. So uh, you just you have to check out his Whiteboard Friday videos with Moz. Uh, I decided to invite Rand onto the show to talk about those videos and the power of video as a storytelling tool and everything else. And he did not disappoint. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Now, before we get there, just a reminder to find us online at thestorytellersnetwork.com for more episodes, how to contact us, and uh, for other resources to help you better tell your story. Now. Let's get to Rand's story. So thanks for uh, thanks for joining me today, Rand. I do appreciate you taking the time to talk storytelling. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Dan. Yeah, looking forward to it. Uh, so the, one of the things that I, I, I kind of like to start with, and I don't know if it's repetitive to, to listeners or, or what, but figuring out the idea that we can be anywhere as storytellers. So where where is where are where are you at right now? Uh, I am in my home in Seattle, Washington. I actually have a, uh, a tool shed out back of my house where I'm starting my new company, Spark Toro. And, uh, but unfortunately, t- Seattle is going to be a little over 90 degrees today. And so the tool shed is um, a little brutal. It does not have air conditioning. And thankfully, the house does. Hence, I'm in the house. At my top. So you get to, you get to start a, another new company f- from home. That's awesome. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, my co-founder, uh, my co-founder is probably even more frugal than I am. But one of the things that we decided we really wanted to do, we, ra- we raised a round of, uh, of funding, an angel round of $1.3 million. And so you might think, oh, okay, so you're going to hire some people, you're going to get some nice Class A office space. No, we are going to pinch pennies. We're going <laughs> to um, and try and get to, uh, get to ramen profitable before we start spending anything. Uh, yeah. So, that, so that's the life of a startup right there, not necessarily net the, the bills for everybody like let's do this right. <laughs> I, I, I was eating uh, uh, ramen for lunch yesterday and I thought, oh, this is the most startup thing I've done in years. I love that. <laughs> That's awesome. So do you, do you consider yourself a, a storyteller, Rand? I mean, other than being a startup founder and CEO that you've been and everything, like, are you a storyteller? I'm a, I'm an aspiring storyteller. Mm-hmm. Right? I want to I think that, I think that storytelling is incredibly powerful. I think it, you know, it resonates so much with, an audience, I, I, I think that if I am successful in my life, if I do the things that I want to do and accomplish them, that um, what comes out of that is a great story and hopefully a story that can be an example to other people, right? And I think, I think that's a big goal that a lot of us have. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you build a company for a few reasons, but I think one of the biggest ones is because the story you want to tell about your professional life is something different from he went to work at an office 40 hours a week. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so I like, I like aspiring storyteller. I think that's one of the things I've noticed out of the 30 some 
conversations that I've had is a lot of us don't necessarily think, oh yeah, I'm a storyteller. I'm, but we try, and that's a, I think that's a good, a good bar to reach for. So that's cool. Yeah. Um, now, so in this season, season three, I'm talking to people who have used video for their storytelling. So um, while you maybe you weren't using video as like a fireside chat storytelling uh, filmmaking thing when you were at Moz, um, and I noticed that you are still doing some whiteboard videos, but you did this video thing called Whiteboard Fridays. Yeah. So, why video for that particular world? Uh, so Whiteboard Friday was an experiment that turned into, I guess, a, you know, really a quite incredible piece of content um, and, and piece of content marketing for us. But the, you know, I think that over time, the goal essentially became, let's provide people who learn best through audio and visual uh, content rather than purely, you know, reading a blog post, let's provide them with a great channel, a great way to learn. And I think that, um, you know, while I'm an aspiring storyteller, I think probably one of my, my reasonably good skills is that I am able to distill complex concepts into simple takeaways, right, that a lot of people can understand. And so SEO is filled with a lot of, SEO being search engine optimization, right, is filled with a lot of complex ideas and, and, and technical aspects, uh, both on the technical and creative side of the practice, and distilling that down into their core components, making things like you know, keyword research and rankings and link building and content marketing and you know, uh, technical audits and crawl issues, making that stuff accessible to people uh, ended up really resonating. And so that's, that's the big reason we stuck with it. And do you think that accessibility is, is, is done well through video? Maybe not for everyone, but like, I mean, cause so I'm, I'm going to say it this way, because if I think about, okay, I want to go hang cabinets or I want to change the oil in my motorcycle, whatever, like I'm going to use video. It makes it accessible. Is that what you guys found through that experience? I think, I think it makes it somewhat accessible, but I, but I also think there's a, there's a human aspect that comes through that is powerful, right? It, when, when I watch instructional videos and there is a clever, creative person, you know, human being behind them, um, yeah, that just, that just works so much better for me, right? I, I, remember, the, I remember the content so much more. Um, and I think that's because, you know, people, people are evolutionarily biased, right? We've been, we've been sort of groomed through these tens of thousands of years to pay attention to each other, not necessarily to pay attention to, you know, lines of text on a screen, but definitely to look each other in the eye and sort of see, read facial expressions and emotions and, um, and have that stick with us. So, you know, you're, you're sort of leaning on this, uh, on this power of, of the built-in aspect of, of humanity. Yeah. Now, so not only was it that human connection, but obviously the videos for you were very, were instructional. You were breaking down, as you said, those complex things. Um, why a whiteboard? Like, I mean, literally if for, the, for those listeners, literally a whiteboard where he wrote on literally it. Literally a whiteboard, yeah. yeah. Um, why that rather than something like a whiteboard technology, like whiteboard animation that everybody's yeah. using now? What, what, what drove so, that decision? I, I did experiment a little bit with some of those other technologies. And, uh, uh, you know, over the years, as the as Whiteboard Friday became popular, a lot of those technology providers would reach out. Some of them even sent us, you know, uh, those those sort of whiteboard texts. Um, and I think the, the reason is a, a few. One, it's very easy to practice and get good at whiteboarding when you do it all day, every day, in your sort of product meetings and engineering meetings and marketing meetings uh, to transfer that over to a physical whiteboard. Mm. Two, it wasn't painful enough to cause us to have a problem with it. Once we got a good lighting set up in the, you know, in the video room, it worked great, right? The, the whiteboard was plenty fine. Um, and in our last two offices that we built at Moz, uh, we actually had uniquely structured rooms specifically for Whiteboard Friday, right? They were filming rooms with like audio dampening and 
you know, expensive, large, uh, high quality whiteboards, a bunch of lights in there, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I, you know, we got more professional with it over time. And then uh, the whiteboard also allowed us to do some really unique things. So we took photos of the whiteboard that they, we would then sort of cut into blocks and use as visual images on the blog posts that went along with the video. And having those, you know, if you go and visit a Whiteboard Friday blog post uh, on the Moz domain, you will see that it's sort of, you know, text and then this visual image and then more text and a descriptor. So we'd find that, you know, we could rank well in Google Images results, that people would take those whiteboard uh, still photos from the whiteboard and use them in their presentations and talks, use them in their own blog posts, right? Um, use them to help explain concepts to people. So, you know, video was powerful, but the additional value of having the visual component that we could extract and republish and repurpose from the video was even even more powerful. So I hear you talking about, uh, in, in that kind of explanation, that multimedia as a storyteller, well, you know, whether it's marketing or whatever, but multimedia is so important when it comes to story and content then. Absolutely. I mean, I think that anytime you have distribution mechanisms like, you know, like Google search and Google images and YouTube and social media, um, being able to take advantage of those by having a multimedia approach that can resonate well on those different platforms, super powerful. So that's a good tip for listeners right now, then listening to multimedia and think about it. Now, my yeah. other, my other thought too, was what you just said about distribution. Um, I kind of understand, uh, I did, uh, I used to be a customer of Moz, uh, been a follower of you for a while and that kind of thing. And so I, I think I know how this works out, but I kind of want to explore this for the storytellers who, you know, if I'm creating a video and I'm putting it on YouTube and then I put it on my blog and then I do this and then I do that, you guys, you actually had a bit of a, a staggered distribution strategy from what yeah. I understand when it came to that. So talk about that a little bit. How did that work for you? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we saw early on, and I think everyone is seeing this now, is that these other channels besides your own website and your own sort of you know email list that you don't fully own and control are dangerous to get addicted to, right? So if five years ago, you were putting stuff on Facebook and you were getting, you know, 25,000 uh, viewers of your content that you put on Facebook every week. That today is probably less than 2,500. Maybe, actually, you know what? It's probably less than 500 people, right? So we're talking about maybe, maybe a 20th, a 50th of the audience that saw your content on Facebook. You know, if you had 100,000 likes, Maybe 25,000 people saw that five years ago. Today, that number is more like 500 people, right? 0.5% of your audience seeing that. And that's, that's on a good day. That's if you have a high quality channel, right? I mean, people, you know, I, I was tweeting about this the other day and someone came back to me and was like, hey, we regularly get 3% engagement. And I kind of had this, yes, you regularly get 3% engagement. That's terrible, you know, and you're proud of it, right, on, on, on Facebook. Now, Facebook is um, only one example like this. So we, we realized the same thing was going to be true with YouTube, the same thing would be true with Twitter, with LinkedIn, with any of these networks uh, that we put content on. And so we always strove to put uh, the content first on our own website, where we could own and control the user experience, where we could cookie folks, where we could capture email addresses, right, where where we own that uh, UX. And as a result, what we did is that you described it well, the staggered distribution method. We would take a Whiteboard Friday video, which they're usually about 12 to 15 minutes long. We would put them on uh, moz.com slash blog, you know, whatever the post that came out was. We would have, you know, these visual elements to them. And then 90 to 120 days later, we would put that same video on YouTube uh, often under a slightly different um, title. And the goal was if somebody searched in Google for, you know, that topic, Whiteboard Friday on moms.com would rank number one. And if somebody searched on YouTube, they could still find that content, but they would realize, right, there'd be something in our channel saying, hey, if you want to get the latest Whiteboard Fridays every week, 
you should go to moz.com. That's when they come out. And you can find them a few months later after they've been published here on YouTube. So we did that staggered distribution in order to drive people to come to our website first rather than just subscribing on YouTube and assuming that was that would work. Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of own, don't rent the content, right? Or the, yeah. the channel anyway, yeah. Yeah, own own your home, right? Don't, you know, don't, uh, don't build your house on rented land, which is really what you're doing on YouTube or Facebook or LinkedIn or any of these other ones. Yeah, great distribution, but not a place to, to live. Um, so, so that was all with, with Moz, had great experience. And obviously you're still a, a, an evangelist for them and, and believe in the SEO and this kind of stuff. But, yeah. but now you've got a new, you mentioned earlier out of the, the tool shed, a new company. How does video play a part at this point in the launch of Spark Toro? Or is video more of a later strategy for you? How, where is that for you right now? Yeah, um, I think it's interesting. So video is something that Casey and I, my co-founder and I have talked about a bunch and sort of said like, hey, Whiteboard Friday was very successful. I think long-term we need a video strategy and we need to do some video content. Uh, we haven't done that yet, but I think that will be coming. So to your point, long-term. I will say though that I've done uh, in the last four months, three, four months since the launch of my book, uh, Lost and Founder, since that came out, I have done a tremendous amount of video like, like the kind you and I are doing today, Dan, right? Where um, I have conversations with folks. Um, I, I meet with people. We have conversations. I did one for, for Creative Live recently. And um, yeah, it's been interesting to see sort of the power of video as a, um, as a guest rather than as the host. Yeah. So let's dive into your book then. Um, that's that was part of my, my hope today is talk a little about that. Um, so not not to not to fangirl too hard here, but uh, love the book, read it. Uh, actually listened on Audible, and, for, and it was like it was like you reading a bedtime story to me. It was it was amazing. Um, but but and as tried to break into my apartment and take <laughs> it got it got weird, but you've forgiven me, so it's okay. I mean now we're yeah. at it's, you know more than five hundred feet, so it's okay. Um, so so as an author who shared some very, some pretty vulnerable stories in your book. Tell me a little bit about that experience. What's it like as a storyteller getting vulnerable like that? Yeah, I, I think, I think there's no better way to create resonance and to share a story than um, identifying the things that make you uncomfortable and that make other people uncomfortable and then being willing to tackle them. Um, I think that we've all, we've all heard a million stories about, um, oh, you know, I uh, came from nothing and then built this company and I'm so successful and that, I don't, that stuff bores me. Like it, it's not just boring, I think it's not the truth, right? The truth is buried somewhere deep inside there. There is, there is something that, whoever it is, Elon Musk and Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and Larry Page and Sergey Brin, there's stuff they're not telling you. We all know that there is. We don't know exactly what it is, but we know it's there. And, and I think that when, what great storytellers do is they identify the things that make us uncomfortable um, and they tackle them head on. And, and when, that, when that happens, I think it's really powerful. And I think it's powerful not just as a sort of reader or consumer of that content. I think it's very powerful as a representation of reality versus this distorted reality field that especially in, you know, startup tech world, which is where I you know, spend a lot of my professional time, spend all my professional time, um, you know, that uh, our world is just overrun with false stories, right? Incomplete stories. So Lost and Founder was an attempt to try and do that differently. And, and it, I think it did it very well. I, I have seen the, the false stories and not that I'm a startup tech person, but I'm a, I'm a fan of it and an outlier. And so yeah. I've, I've heard those stories and I was, um, I was, a, I was a, a client of HubSpot. That's where I've seen you speak yeah. in, in the past at, at Inbound. And so to have that broken down and to know this is how it really is was like, wow. And to know that and one of the stories that you shared was when they actually made an offer to your company. And, th and then you look back years later and you're like, man, that was really hard to, 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 to grapple with. I mean, was it, was it therapeutic for you to tell those stories? 
Yes, yes ish. Um, although a funny experience that happened during the writing process, right? I had this this great editor, Nikki Papadopoulos from uh, from Penguin Random House, and you know, Nikki and I worked together on the book for eighteen months, two years, right? Wow. Um, and basically, you know, a lot of the times I would submit a chapter or you know send her something, and she would say, "Hey, I'm glad you wrote this. I get that it's cathartic for you." I know that you needed to get this off your chest, but it doesn't serve the reader, so we're taking it out. Um, and that I think that is a wonderful kind of true north guidance for a storyteller is, hey, you might there might be seven books in you, and you should cull those seven down to the one that serves your reader. Um, and I, I, I really found that, that advice valuable. So yes, it was therapeutic writing it, uh, a lot of the therapeutic for me stuff did not make it into the book, but um, still good to to be able to pour your heart out that way. And and how cool was it to be able to read your own audible, your own audio book? Was that like, did, did you strive for that or did that just happen by happenstance? Cause I feel like most of the time it's this professional voiceover actor who does it. Like how did yeah. you, how did, how did you swing that one? <laughs> uh, so I, I asked them, I said that, Hey, since, because a lot of people know my voice from you know professional events and from Whiteboard Friday, I thought that it would actually be better if I read it and they agreed. Hmm. Um, but man, it is a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. It is a crazy amount of work. I have I have tons of respect for people who do that professionally because you know you're in I was in the studio what four or five sort of full days, right? Like eight hour days. And your voice gets tired and, you know, you get sort of tired. You're reading lines over and over again. Any little mess up or mistake or uh, pause in the wrong spot, breath in the wrong spot, you know, they make you reread it. Um, you slow down or speed up too much. You got to reread it. So it is, it's an intense, intense process. But I'm really, I mean, I'm very glad that I got to be the one to read it and, um, yeah, excited that folks like yourself got to listen to that. Yeah. And, and so I like to try and pull out little lessons for the listeners too. My, my lesson there that I hear you say is build up to it. You you wouldn't necessarily write your first book and say, okay, I'm going to do the recording. And everybody goes, yeah, sure, go for it. Like you kind of have to have a reputation, a book of work, yeah. that kind of thing. No, so. I think, I mean, I think if it was, if it was not the case that people knew my voice, my personal voice well already, many of my audience did, I would have gone with their, you know, gone with the standard route of getting a professional voice actor. Yeah. So Sarand, I've seen you speak at events. I mentioned inbound earlier. I've seen you speak. I've watched your videos and, and you're always an engaging presenter. Um, do you have a preference video versus live versus writing? Um, what's, what's your mode of storytelling? Mm. Yeah. Interesting. I think that the one the one that's the most work for me is certainly the events, right? In the live presentation setting, you sort of have one shot to get it right. Um, you know, the story that you tell needs to needs to resonate well. It is it's tough to do, especially in a professional sort of you know technical field, to both tell a good story and have a bunch of actionable tactical takeaways, right? Those are um, those are two things that are sort of competing for your attention and um, weaving them together well is an art that, uh, you know, that I think I'll, I'll be working on for the rest of my life. Uh, yeah. I would say that with writing, writing is the easiest one for me on that front. I think that through the written medium, just because I'm, I don't know, I'm a relatively fast writer and, uh, don't struggle with that medium as much. Yeah, I can, I can do a pretty decent job uh, through written. The challenge is I, I think even when I do a great job of writing, it, it doesn't resonate the same way. It, doesn't, it is not remembered the same way as video or you know, in-person events. You know, if, you, if you come see someone speak on a stage, um, the degree to which you recall them and sort of their personality and how the presentation made you feel and, you know, whether you want to see them again and would recommend them is, is very high compared to, Oh, I read this blog post by this person. Yeah. Um, 
I think in person is is sort of at the top of that, and then video is right underneath it, and you know, written content below that. And when so you mentioned the competing between storytelling and giving actionable steps and and nuggets to take away this kind of a thing. Where do you start with that? If you're giving a presentation, do you have do you start with the facts and craft a story around it, or do you have stories in mind that you want to back up with facts? How do you prepare for that? I, I go story first, mm-hmm. right? So I basically, try and tell a story of hey. He, um, you know, try and follow that classic structure, right? Of sort of like um, things were things were this way, then a problem occurred, right? And 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 it created all of these challenges. And you know, here's this sort of tipping point of um, a, a climax of of the action, and then the resolution being here's the tactical, you know, here's how to deal with this, here's how to overcome this problem. Um, and hopefully leaving people on the high note of you, know, you can find a way, find a way out of this. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Um, so let's talk about inspiration. I know some storytellers uh, may have a, a muse as it were, uh, or they have a specific, you know, uh, thing they do before they, they create their stories. Do you have an inspiration that, that helps you tell a better story? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's going to be a weird one though. Um, when, when someone, um, someone or something sort of expresses a, an opinion or, or a set of data or a, you know, basically tells a story that I strongly disagree with, that I think is absolute BS, that is my inspiration, right? So when I see this like, um, you know, oh, someone is sharing a, hey, there's you know, no more opportunity left in SEO. You know, then then I get up on my high horse and I'm like, let's go to the data, shall we? I hate it. <laughs> and and I'll I'll craft a presentation like that. Or if someone says, oh, the only way to fund your startup, you know, if you are a real startup, you've got to raise venture capital. And I'll go, oh, yeah. Now it's time. Now let me tell you a story about how venture capital can go, and statistically speaking, you know, what the five year survival rates are, and right? I'll, I'll, I'll get on that high horse. So yeah, I think when I have something that I strongly emotionally disagree with, um, I, I want to tell a story about it. Yeah. Now, so you, you mentioned venture capitalists. So I, I, I just kind of, this kind of hit me there. I feel like there's a tie between venture capitalists and like the people behind the money behind stories. So let's say if I'm a storyteller, I'm a writer, or I want to create a, a short film or something, I'm going to, I'm going to probably end up people, people throwing me money, which gets to be enticing as a, so whether you want to answer this as a startup uh, founder or as, as a storyteller, how do you weed out the people that want to give you money for the right reasons? And the ones that you're just going to be like, yeah, you wanted to give me 10 million, but you're kind of a, kind of a jerk. How do you Mm. deal with that as, as a, like I said, either storyteller or founder? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the best ways I talked about this a little bit in the, in the book, one of the best ways is to talk to other people who have taken money from those investors or backers, right? Um, and you know, this is one of the beautiful things about Kickstarter is that you don't have to worry. <laughs> you, know, mm-hmm. you don't have to care nearly as much um, or, or, or Patreon or some of these other alternative funding sources. But uh, yeah, with, gosh, with taking money, my best, my best advice on that front is talk to the people who've done it before. Ask them what the experience was like. Um, Talk to some of the people, if you can, talk to some of the people who pitched them and been turned down. I think that very often there's a difference in how people are treated uh, by those folks when, you know, their projects have sort of been successful and been funded by them and all that kind of thing versus um, those folks who said no or uh, they have, you know, initially funded them but then backed away from more support in the future. You can get, you can get a lot of information that way. Yeah. So, so doing your research, getting a good feel for them. Yeah. Like that, you know, yeah. I mean, it should be like a job interview, right? You talk to the person, but then you go check the references, right? You talk to people who've worked for them in the past. You talk to people, try and talk to people who sort of not were a level above them, but were a level below them, right? Because I think that, I think that the, a true sign of how a person acts is how they treat people who they don't have to be nice to. Right. That's good. Anything from them. Yeah, I like that. So uh, I, I want to go back to 
you you were talking uh, we we're talking earlier about different platforms and, and the, the staggered distribution idea and and this is something i've been thinking about with a lot of storytellers as we're i don't have the same platform that let's say you have because you moz is, is huge so how do we get to that point if those storytellers that are just starting out or who and, and whatever it looks like whether you're in marketing you know whether you're a writer how are we supposed to get our stories out there today with so much noise I mean, I think, I think it is harder than ever to stand out um, from the crowd because there are, there's so much competition for time and attention, and that demands something truly unique, right? I think that, um, I think that trying to find an area uh, where you can provide unique value that no one else does in your field um, with sort of an angle and a story that no one else has told yet. Um, and in a distribution mechanism that has high potential, right? So um, maybe you are, you know, a phenomenal contributor on Reddit and, you know, everyone loves the stories that you submit to writing prompts, you know, the, the subreddit over there. Or maybe you are, you know, a phenomenal um, creator of video content and you know, you know, a bunch of other YouTube creators who would happily feature your stuff and talk about what you're doing. Great. Right. I'm, I think, I think having a network also helps a lot. So it, to the degree that you can find people who are willing to support and amplify what you've created, uh, that can go a really long way. How do you how do you build one of those networks? Is it all about the value you bring, or is it how you can help them? How does that look? Um, yeah, I think to the to some degree, it's it's really really helpful to be someone who assists others, right? I, would, I certainly um, built a lot of my career and a lot of my network because I, as I was learning SEO, I was helping a lot of people do it. I I still help people do it, um, and I think that that. That uh, builds camaraderie and credibility. It also builds people who trust you and like you and want to support you. Um, and that that can be absolutely huge. I, you know, my my wife Geraldine is a a writer. Um, she's a true storyteller, right? She uh, her, her first book was uh, um, all over the place, and that's it's sort of a memoir. Uh, and that. One of the things that, that she's done that I, um, I think has been hugely helpful is built a group of other you know, women writers uh, in her field who support one another and you know, email regularly and help each other with pitches and with reviews and that, those kinds of things. Um, and that's a big deal. I, I've done the same thing in my professional network, you know, on the web marketing side, on the startup side, having kind of a network of people who I can lean on um, is big. Yeah. Uh, so geek out question for a minute here. Uh, Quora versus Reddit. Uh, <laughs> Reddit? <laughs> almost always take Reddit. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I just thought of that as you're talking about Reddit, I was like, you know, I wonder about Quora content and I mean, kind of I, I don't, I don't I mean they're different. But yeah, they're, they are very different. I think, I think Quora has, um, some resonance in the right places, right? If you can, if you can sort of get your answer into, a good position there. You can do well on that platform, but um, yeah, Reddit has a lot more participation, still you know, 10, a hundred times more traffic. Yeah. So um, how, how does social media affect this craft of storytelling? I mean, you have people that you admire as storytellers. You mentioned Geraldine. Um, how do you think social media affects that craft? Sorry, someone said my name. I, I did. Yes. How are you, Geraldine? Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, We'll get her on the podcast next time. Um, yes. Uh, how does how does social media affect the, this like uh, proper craft of storytelling? Does is it good? Is it bad? Is it, it different? Um, I mean, I think it it has positives and negatives, right? So it can be a great distribution platform, but it can also make you bias a lot of your content and stories to fit the platform, right? And social media, of course. You know, they, the things that do well there are sort of short and punchy. They don't, you know, they don't necessarily tell the whole story. Um, so there are, there are challenges uh, with social. I think, I think social can bias 
writers and creators to do some unnatural things and that kind of sucks but you know if you can get the distribution out of it um that it can be worthwhile yeah uh double-edged sword as it were right yeah exactly um so i look at uh, somebody who has started their own company who is starting a new company who has a book out who did all the things as somebody who has made it in the world and not that like not that like making it means you're done i mean obviously right right what, what does making it look like to you? Do you look around your life and go, man, this is pretty blessed? I, I should do that more, <laughs> um, uh, certainly. But yes, I mean, I think I feel, I think I feel very lucky. The, um, I think for me, I, I have a very high expectation and a very high set of standards for myself. So I, um, and maybe maybe slowly over the years that's changed a little bit. I don't I don't necessarily mean that my standards have gotten lower, but they've become different, right? So when I was you know running a venture backed startup, my goal was okay, I need to become a unicorn, right? That's you know mm-hmm. how do I return you know a massive amount of money to my investors? Um, and I think as I've gotten older, one of the things I realized is even if I had accomplished that. While that would be, you know, maybe a nice sort of notch on my belt to have, that doesn't do a whole lot of good for anyone that I care that much about, right? I mean, my investors, I like them, I care about them, but they're already extraordinarily wealthy. You know, a few tens of millions or hundreds of millions more dollars will not do anything particularly different in their lives. Um, and so instead, it, you know, I, I think I came to this realization that there are different kinds of people that I really want to help. Um, that, that what I'd like to see is, you know, with Spark Toro, for example, right? I, I am trying to build a company in a different sort of way um, with a very unique financing structure uh, that I hope if we are successful, other people will be able to do. And, and if they are able to do that, you know, if that becomes a model that other people can pursue, that it will let a lot more people into the startup world, right? That that a lot more people can build companies um, who couldn't previously, right? And that that the gatekeeping that prevents a lot of folks from being able to access institutional capital, right? Venture and private equity, um, that those those gates will open because angels can provide a tremendous, you know, and all sorts of funding can provide a lot more opportunity. I think, you know, SparkToro is also different in that it's continuing the mission that I had at Moz, which is to help people do better marketing, but in a different sector, right? So not just SEO, um, but trying to help folks reach the publications and people that influence their audiences and get in front of those. And hopefully maybe, I mean, if we're very successful, my hope is that we can like untangle a little bit the chokehold that Facebook and Google have over all of the marketing and advertising dollars in you know, in, in digital marketing, I, I think it's ridiculous that, you know, well, how are you going to go market your new company or new product? Well, we'll just throw a bunch of money at Facebook and Google and let them deal. With it. <laughs> yeah, that is that a great way for, for everyone to operate? No, but that has been how it's gone the last 15 years. And yeah, I'd love to be part of a change that distributes more of that attention and awareness um, and dollars to you know, events that are putting on great shows and to podcasters who are putting together great programs, um, to writers and authors and bloggers and social media marketers and and content creators of all different kinds um, who deserve that sponsorship and that, you know, those, those publications have been left behind a little bit. Yeah. So making it to you really is helping people around you. I think it's like in a big way. Yeah, it's like changing the world in the way that I want it to change. Yeah. Um, and some of that is through helping people directly and some of it's indirect and some of it's by being an example or, you know, by representation and some of it's by, you know, um, lifting up opportunities for other folks, right? Uh, some of it's through teaching. So, yeah, I think that that will certainly be it. And there's a financial component to it too, right? I, I you know, I don't think of myself as, I, I think I am still mostly a capitalist. Um, I see lots of problems with capitalism, but I'm not, 
totally convinced that we should tear down the system yet. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, as a result, I, I think, you know, for me, I have, I have this standard of, I really would like to see a company that I build have a great, you know, um, financial return for its founders and investors. Um, and that's, that's true at both Moz and, and for, uh, for uh, Spark Toro. Yeah. So, so even though you're only an aspiring storyteller, uh, maybe you haven't told enough stories to be done yet, but if somebody said to you, Rand, you're done telling stories, what would your last story be that you'd want to go out on? What would that look like for you? Um, I mean, it, it would, it would definitely be, um, it would definitely be the story of my, my sort of romance with Geraldine. Yeah. Like that is so far the, the thing that I am most proud of in my life. The thing that brings me the most joy. Um, yeah. And maybe a story that I haven't talked about very much. That would be a good, I would, I would listen to that story. Yeah. It's a, that's a worthwhile story to tell. Awesome. Well, thanks for your time, Rand. I really do appreciate it. Um, it's been great chatting with you and hearing yeah. about video and everything else. Uh, where is the best people, the best people, where's the best place for people uh, to connect with you and SparkToro and everything else? Yeah. Uh, so on the website, sparktoro.com, uh, we've got a blog there and some free tools that you can check out, especially if you're a Twitter addict like I am. Uh, and I am most active on that social network. So Twitter at Rand Fish. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me for any other reason, and I can be helpful to you, I'm Rand at sparktoro.com. Very good. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time today, man. It's been a pleasure. And, uh, and thanks yeah. for being part of the Storytellers Network, man. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Dan. Take care. All right. Thank you so much to my guest, Rand Fishkin. Be sure to visit him online. You can find those resources he mentioned and more uh, in the show notes. And if you enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing it all over the place and tag Rand as well if you want. Uh, put it on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, wherever you want to go. Uh, anywhere you can share it with other storytellers. It's always helpful to reach new folks, and especially, uh, you know, on that social media. It just it helps, uh, you know, tag me, tag Rand. It helps uh, build that audience. So thank you so much. And Speaking of building an audience, uh, one of the ways that we do that is through reviews. Uh, so thank you so much for those who have left reviews. Uh, if you enjoy what we're doing here, please consider leaving a review. In fact, here's one I just had to share. First of all, because of the username, uh, it's pretty awesome, but also because it gets to the heart of my mission with the Storytellers Network. So Hippie Dad 77865 Hippie Dad, I love that, uh, says, I'm learning to use stories to help me sell more to my customers, and this podcast has been a great resource. Uh, that's fantastic. That's part of my hope here. Uh, is to help you tell your story better in business and in life. So until next time, here's to telling our stories and having those stories to tell. Cheers. Cheers.